The story you are about to hear is a compilation of documented true facts featuring historical characters, events, or places that has played a role in shaping history. Please sit back and listen as I recite this narrative for you. The Oakland County child killer took the lives of at least four young children and spread fear throughout the residents of Oakland County, Michigan between February 1976 and March 1977. The person or persons responsible was never caught and the murders of the young innocent victims remains unsolved. Chances are, when the cops received the report of a child missing, they just mistook the reports as from someone who was overly worried. After all, bad things didn't happen in Oakland County which envelopes the suburbs of Detroit. The first was 12-year-old Mark Stibbins who was abducted while walking home from the American Legion Hall in Ferndale on February 13, 1976. His body was found six days later in a parking lot behind an office building nine miles away in Southfield. He had died approximately 36 hours before his body was discovered. The autopsy revealed the cause of death as suffocation, possibly with a pillow. The child had been sexually assaulted with an object, but his body was meticulously cleaned and laid out where it would be discovered easily. The time of death was hard to ascertain, but it was concluded that he had only been dead a short time, meaning that Mark had been held captive for several days before his murder. The scariest thing was that Mark appeared to have been selected at random. No clues, no witnesses, no suspects. Police beat their heads against the wall and waited, but the next 10 months proved eerily calm. On December 22, 12-year-old Jill Robinson disappeared from her home in Royal Oak after having an argument with her mother and threatening to run away. Her body was found four days later six miles away in Troy on the other side of I-75. The top of Jill's skull had been blown off by a point-blank shotgun blast. Passing drivers could see a circle of red around the wound like a crimson halo in the snow. The murder of Jill Robinson wasn't instantly linked to that of Mark Stibbins. Jill died due to being shot in the face at close range with a shotgun. She also hadn't been the victim of a sexual assault unlike Mark. The final reason was that they were of the opposite sex. A killer usually has a type. It is rare to go after both genders. There was one significant connection. Jill, just like Mark, was found in the same clothes she was wearing when she vanished. Like Mark, this clothes had also been washed before the body was dumped. Again, her body had been scrubbed clean and redressed in her own clothes. Even her backpack was replaced before being laid out neatly on a roadside snowbank. The care he lavished on the corpse of his young victim earned the killer the sardonic nickname, The Babysitter. The next victim was 10-year-old Christine Mehelek, who disappeared on her way to a 7-Eleven in Berkeley on January 2, 1977. With the recent murder of Jill Robinson, a sense of urgency saw the police quickly begin to investigate the disappearance of Christine Mehelek. A cashier serving at the store Christine had set off to visit confirmed that she had been to the store and purchased a magazine that afternoon. Officers went door to door in the surrounding area in a hunt for witnesses, but came up empty-handed. The search for any other clues as to Christine's whereabouts also came up blank. A look at some 4,000 known sex offenders in Michigan area also turned up nothing. Her body was found days later, seven miles away, at the roadside in Franklin Village, 19 days later. Her hand was sticking out of the snow. She had been smothered. Her body had been cleaned like the others and laid out in a funerary position. No clear evidence was detectable of a sexual assault. However, it was originally recorded by an autopsy worker that sperm had been found in the victim's vagina and rectum. This was then dismissed by the state police who stated no sperm was present. The last certain victim was 11-year-old Timothy King, who went missing on March 16, 1977 in Birmingham after skateboarding to a local drugstore. He borrowed 30 cents from his big sister and rode three blocks to the corner pharmacy to buy some candy. 
When Birmingham police got the frantic call that night that he hadn't come home, they started mobilizing. By the next day, some 100 cops had spread out to search for the little boy. Maybe he could be the one they saved. His father made a TV appeal and his mother wrote a letter to the Detroit News promising him his favorite meal, a chicken dinner, if he returned home safely. A woman said she had seen a boy with a skateboard talking to a man in a parking lot of the store that Timmy had told his parents he was going to. A composite drawing of the suspect was released. He was thought to have been driving a blue AMC Gremlin with a white side stripe. A week after he went missing, Timothy King was found dead in a ditch 12 miles away near Livonia. Timothy, like all the previous victims, had been well fed and meticulously clean during his days held captive. Timothy's final meal had been Kentucky Fried Chicken, indicating the killer had read the letter written by Timothy's parents, which noted this as his favorite meal. The cause of death was suffocation, with the autopsy indicating the murder only took place hours before his body was discovered. This meant that the twisted killer had horrifyingly kept Timothy captive for five days, during which time he was sexually assaulted by his killer. It was clear that these killings were related. All victims were snatched off the street in seemingly safe areas and held captive for several days before being murdered. They showed signs of being well cared for and bathed. All the victims were redressed in their own clothing with most of their belongings intact and there was evidence of sexual trauma on both boys, not on the girls. But there was no obvious connection between the kids other than that they lived relatively close together in a small area of the same county. By December 1978, the task force had been terminated and put into the hands of state police. To this day, the identity of the Oakland County child killer remains unknown. Suspicion fell on auto worker David Norberg. He had driven a blue Opal, which looked very similar to the blue Gremlin that was seen in the parking lot when Timothy King had disappeared. Soon after, he had stopped driving it. Then, he moved from Southeast Michigan to Wyoming, where he resumed driving it. He was apparently a violent man who physically and sexually assaulted both his wife and his sister. There was speculation that he had killed two girls other than the two known victims of the Oakland County child killer. He died in a car accident not long after moving. After he died, his widow said she found a silver cross inscribed Christine among his belongings. Christine Mehalek had owned such a cross according to her aunt. Mrs. Norberg also said that she had found a St. Christopher's medal. Timothy King wore one that was never recovered. In a green warm pin, like the one Jill Robinson wore. But Mrs. Norberg said she had given this away after her husband died and could not remember who she gave them to. When compared to a hair found on Timothy King, Norberg's DNA was not a match. Despite this, investigators refused to rule David Norberg out completely as they couldn't be certain the hair belonged to Timothy's killer. The case then went on the back burner. Then, Following the 2005 arrest of Dennis Rader for the BTK, bind, torture, kill murders in the 1970s, Michigan police revived the investigation into the unsolved Oakland County killings using the advanced computer databases and forensic techniques now available. In 2005, while being questioned about an unrelated murder, prisoner Richard Lawson gave police the name of the man he believed to be the Oakland County child killer, Ted Lamborghini. Lawson admitted that he was part of a group of pedophiles operating in Detroit's Cass Corridor in the 1970s. Amongst his fellow six associates were two wealthier men named Bob Moore and Ted Lamborghini, who Lawson knew as Ted Orr. Lamborghini and Moore would entice and groom young boys from the financially deprived area with money and food before abusing them at Moore's bike shop or at nearby motels. Lawson told the interviewing officer Lamborghini would also on occasion venture out and attain young boys from wealthier areas such as Birmingham and Royal Oak. The group would also participate in pedophile sex orgies where guests would bring a child to be shared around. 
According to Lawson on one occasion, Ted Lamborghini had shown him a photo album owned by Bob Moore. The album contained images of the various young boys that had been abused. Upon one particular photo, Lamborghini turned to Lawson and told him that the child looked like the king boy and gave Lawson a wink. The investigating officers decided to investigate the claims further. They soon found Bob Moore was already deceased. He died of a cardiac arrest in his home with his own pit bulls indulging in a feast of his remains before he was found. Ted Lamborghini, however, was still very much alive. Upon his arrest and to the surprise of the interviewing officers, Ted Lamborghini confessed to much of what Richard Lawson had said. However, despite his confession to being a pedophile, he denied he was also a murderer. Lamborghini agreed to take a lie detector test to prove his innocence. Investigators had been here before and so they again expected another suspect to pass the polygraph test. This time, they were wrong. To their surprise, Lamborghini failed the test, the first to do so in over 300 such tests conducted in relation to the Oakland County child killer case. Unfortunately, there was nothing else to link Lamborghini to the murders. Over a dozen living victims did testify against Lamborghini for sexual abuse against children. He was sentenced to life in prison. Despite being offered a possible plea bargain for information on the Oakland County child killer case, Lamborghini refused to cooperate. Christopher Bush became a newly named suspect somewhat by chance in 2006. The King family received a call from a California polygraph examiner and a former friend and neighbor of Timothy King named Patrick Coffey. Coffey told them that he had recently attended a conference where he was involved in a revealing conversation. According to Coffey, Lawrence Wesser, a fellow attendee, informed him that 30 years prior, he was asked to conduct a polygraph test arranged by an attorney on her own client. The unnamed client had apparently confessed to being the Oakland County child killer. The King family contacted investigators about the new information. Months passed until they received a call from an investigator who asked if the family had known anyone with the last name Bush. Further research by the family revealed a known pedophile who had previously been a suspect back in 1977. His name was Christopher Bush. He was the son of a high-level executive working for General Motors. He was also known to have repeatedly been arrested for his sexual encounters with children. In 1977, Christopher Bush's friend and fellow sicko Gregory Green had been arrested. During questioning, Green told officers that he and Bush often fantasized about abducting a young boy and keeping them captive. Green then made the startling claim that Christopher Bush had murdered Mark Stibbins. Gregory Green and Christopher Bush were then interviewed by Michigan State Police and the pair undertook a polygraph test relating to the Oakland County child killer cases. Both men passed and were cleared of involvement on January 28, 1977 two months before the murder of final known victim, Timothy King. Gregory Green was sentenced to life for multiple counts of sexual abuse against children. Christopher Bush somehow was able to get charges reduced to molesting boys and was given a probation sentence. Less than two years later, Christopher Bush seemingly took his own life on November 20, 1978. He had, according to his family, killed himself following depression resulting from his ongoing legal troubles. In 2009, a new task force looking into the murders were able to obtain a new DNA profile from hairs found on the bodies of the first victim, Mark Stibbins, and the final victim, Timothy King. A further hair sample was obtained from a hair found on the body of Christine Mihalik. This new evidence led law enforcement to two new suspects the first of which was James Vincent Gunnels. In 1977, Gunnels was known to have kept company with two other possible suspects in the case, Christopher Bush and Gregory Green, who were both questioned about the killings at the same time. Gunnels himself was only 15 years old and was a victim of sexual abuse at the hands of Bush and Green. The evidence which linked James Vincent Gunnels to the Oakland County child killer case was the hair found on Kristen Mihalik. 
the evidence was only a mitochondrial DNA match as opposed to a nuclear or autosomal DNA match. However, it was still seen as an exciting development. When questioned about this new evidence, James Vincent Gunnels, then age 47, denied knowing the victim and was at a loss to explain how his DNA came to be on Kristen's body. Gunnels wasn't charged in relation to the Oakland County child killer case and for reasons unknown, he is no longer considered a suspect by law enforcement. He has continued to state publicly his innocence in relation to the case. Those who believe in Gunnell's involvement lean more to him being an accomplice to others as an opposed to the killer himself. The second suspect to come from new DNA evidence was a convicted pedophile named Arch Sloan. The hair samples found on the clothing of victims Mark Stibbins and Timothy King were matched to further hair samples taken from a 1966 Pontiac Bonneville. The vehicle belonged to the new suspect, Arch Sloan. He has a long history of sickening sexual behavior towards children and was serving a lifetime prison term when the new evidence was discovered. In October of 1983, a workmate of Sloan's had allowed his 10-year-old son to spend the night with Sloan with the belief that they would be going fishing early the next morning. During the stay, Sloan sexually abused and raped the young boy. In 1985, Sloan was convicted for the crime. Although there was a DNA match to the hair found in his car, testing revealed it wasn't a match for Arch Sloan. Despite this, investigators strongly believed that Sloan was still involved or at least knew the person or persons that were. Arch Sloan was offered a deal for his cooperation with the investigation, including his release from prison. Sloan turned down the request. To this day, the identity of the Oakland County child killer remains unknown. Hey everyone, I just wanted to express how grateful I am that you took the time to listen to my narration. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I am Twisted Mind and please enjoy the rest of your day. Salamat.